Hello there, zoologists and bored people alike. Welcome to Bumblebee. I'm your host, Teresa, and today I'm acting as your tour guide in the zoo of obscurity because today's video is about the top 10 bizarre extinct animals you won't believe existed. I want to start off strong, you know, real invigorating animal. Something you haven't heard of, and what better than whatever this is. Here is what we know about it. So, among all the carnivorous mammals that have ever lived, the Androsaurus might have been the largest. Uh, it eats meat. It lives in the Inner Mongolia region of China around 56 to 33.9 million years ago. Well, it's vaguely related to present day hippos and aquatic mammals such as whales and manatees. Yeah, I think that's about it. Honestly, we know next to nothing about the Androsaurus. A guy named Roy Chapman Andrews, who became the director of the American Museum of Natural History and was an explorer, found a foot and a skull belonging to this creature, but nothing else. And no other fossils have ever come to light before or after. Thus, it's named after him as the finder. Still, based on related animals, the Androsaurus seemed to be about the size of a rhino and took down prey with massive jaws, acting more like an enormous wolf than a cat. Hopefully, more found fossils will fill in what we know about these 45 million year old enigmas, but if we've only found a foot and a skull, the future's looking pretty dim for Andrew. At least he gets to live on in the video game Ark Survival Evolved. And hey, if you don't want your future looking dim like dinos, instead as bright as the asteroid that hit them, be sure to subscribe to The Hive for more of Bumblebee's regularly posted videos. This one makes me happy. I don't have to see the pictures, but you do. Number 9 is the koala lemur. Well crap guys, looks like we found Gonzo's genetic lineage because what the hell is this thing? I literally hate every single photo I've seen of the koala lemurs who are an extinct genus, thank god honestly, that belong to the family of the Megalopedia. They once inhabited the island of Madagascar but died out 500 years ago due to habitat fragmentation and deforestation. The koala lemur earned its nickname from the cranial and dental similarities to the Australian koala, which eats exclusively eucalyptus leaves. But since the two species are not closely related in the slightest, these anatomical similarities are likely a result of convergent evolution, perhaps adaptions for leaf eating diets. I don't know. Speaking of convergent evolution, ideally that's also the explanation as to why this whack job animal has high anatomical similarities to the snub nosed monkey, normal, and horses. These big B words to make a matter of its appearance somehow dramatically worse were literally the weight and sometimes the size of an adult person, averaging 5 foot 3 feet and approximately 187 pounds. Rest assured though, they were only one of the 17 giant lemur species on Madagascar. While there's still many lemur species on the island today, more than 100, the big boy ones died out between 500 and 2000 years ago. There's been a lot of fascinating news of these guys recently, so let's cover dire wolves for number 8. Their bones are commonly found in the La Bria tar pits of West Hollywood, but these bad boys, like their feline counterparts, the saber-toothed tiger, ran the show in North America long before the Ice Age, or running full speed into a tar pit, wiped them out. So this wolf species is about the same length as the modern gray wolf, but it weighed a little bit more, as much as 175 pounds. Think of how there are normal German shepherds, and they're already pretty big animals, but then there are king German shepherds, which are like the cap lock version of the original dog. Both have strong jaws, but only one is so strong it can sever a human arm from the body. So it's that, but a billion years ago, feral and bigger. Nonetheless, they went extinct about actually 10,000 years ago, and while their smaller cousins thankfully are still around, having made a comeback in recent years thanks to the reintroduction programs like Yellowstone National Parks, studies emerging just this week are revealing the recent findings that saber-toothed cats and dire wolves appear to have suffered major bone and joint disease towards the end of their existence, a discovery that may indicate these creatures were forced to breed with their litter mates as they went extinct. For the dire wolf, 2.6% of their femurs and 4.5% of their shoulders had defects towards the end of their species. Nothing says relaxing evening at the park like number 7. Instead of feeding them some breadcrumbs, you're running away from them. Terror birds. After the dinosaurs died, someone had to fill in their big shoes, and from the dust and the darkness emerged the one animal that would tell all others, hold my beer. For much of the Cenozoic era, terror birds don't dominated South America and hunted for sport, running upwards of 60 miles per hour and using its face as a literal hatchet against other animals, until they went extinct themselves around 2 million years ago. Though numerous different breeds of the species have been discovered, the largest of this flightless bird stood at 10 feet tall and weighed more than 1,000 pounds. Its enormous skull, one of the largest known skulls for terror birds, and as a matter of fact the largest known bird skull period to quote, that said, some scientists have suggest terror birds were more burp, 
and bite despite that. And they weren't predators at all, but rather herbivores. Don't feel peace at that though. Like mentioned, it means when they did hunt, it was for sport, not food. And that's a different kind of crazy. Paleontologist Louis Schiap feeds the nightmare machine by casually mentioning an interview. I mean, we know that a little parrot, a cockatoo, can take your finger off, Schiap told The Wired. But imagine what a bird like that could have done. The damage it could have done with just a strike of this massive skull and beak. Yeehaw! Up next is the Syrian wild ass, number six. This little kick ass guy was one of the smallest equine there ever was, and I guess its tiny stature didn't allow room for any emotion that wasn't spite, because these guys refused to be domesticated. By the way, scientists like saying that they couldn't be, but that really means a species just wanted nothing to do with humans. So, the Syrian wildie lived in the desert, semi deserts, dry grasslands, and mountain steppes. Native to West Asia, they were also found in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. Its color changed with the seasons, turning a tawny olive color in the summer months and a pale sandy yellow in the winter. Between its beautiful coat and remarkable face, these animals were compared to a thoroughbred horse for aesthetic and strength. There's actually a lot of stories about them too. Xiophon of Athens mentions Syrian wildies in his Anabasis of 370 BCE. He reports that they were the most common of animals encountered in Syria and that horsemen would occasionally chase them for fun, since the wildies could easily outrun the horses. Xiophon then said it was almost like a game for them, as they would only run a short distance ahead of the horses before stopping, waiting for the horses to get closer, and then running ahead again. He also said that the little wildy guys were impossible to catch without careful planning first, and the meat tasted like a more tender version of venison. It's believed that they may be the wild ass that Ishmael was prophesied to be in Genesis in the Old Testament, and there are also references to the animal that appear in the Old Testament books of Job, Psalms, Jeremiah, and the deuterocanonical book of Siraj. They even get a Quran shout out. European travelers in the Middle East East during the 15th and 16th centuries reported seeing large herds, but tragically their numbers began to drop during the 18th and 19th centuries due to overhunting and then a regional upheaval of World War I. The last known wild specimen was fatally popped in 1927 in Jordan, and the last captive specimen died the same year in Vienna. Number 5, Giraffe Moose. Oh what, you think I'm kidding? Bam. Giraffe Moose. Tell me if that is anything else. This Giraffe Moose, actually named the Zevotherium, is an extinct genus of giraffe that ranged throughout Africa to the Indian subcontinent. It was the largest giraffe known and also possibly the largest ruminant of all time. Remains have been recovered from the Himalayan foothills dating around 1 million BC, and scholars agree that species came to be around 7 million years ago in the late Miocene and was likely gone by the early Pliocene. But, um, oopsies. How did it go extinct a million years ago if there's evidence of its existence up until 8,000 years ago, dummies? Some of the earliest indications were found in an ancient rock paintings in the Sahara and in the central West India. Then, when archaeologists were tearing up the ancient Sumerian city-state of Quiche in 1920s, they find an elaborate copper rain ring created to fit onto the tongue of a chariot, and the artists had carefully recreated a unique animal down to the smallest details. And what can be seen is an awful like a Cibitherium, which can be thoroughly reconstructed from fossil remains. Unlike giraffes of today, Cibitheriums had short necks with short stocky legs, and at the time of their first discovery of the bones of the mammals in the 1800s, Researchers, I wish I was joking, thought it might be the link between giraffes and elephants, and now I have to get that image out of my brain. And what better to follow up the moose giraffe than number four, desert rat kangaroo? That one isn't even a lazy nickname I thought of. These novelist at heart scientists really named this thing with the cadence of a hillbilly. Well, it jumps like a kangaroo, looks like a rat, and it's in the desert. That's a mighty fine name we got there, right as is. To make up for the lack of ingenuity, the indigenous of the outback had a pretty fun name for it, Ulukuntha. This small hopping marsupial from the desert regions of central Australia has a kind of crazy backstory. It was discovered in the early 1840s, and by discovered, I mean colonizers learned about it for the first time. The indigenous of the terrain had been using it as a food source for centuries, but then it vanishes for 90 years. The species was then rediscovered in 1931 by Hedley Finlayson, a one eyed, one handed chemist with a passion for Australian mammals. Imagine a little animal about the bulk of a rabbit, but built like a kangaroo, with a long, spindly hind leg, tiny forelegs, full Folded tight on its chest and a tail half as long, again, as the body, but not much thicker than a lead pencil, he had written. Now, 
now one of our only visual accounts because that was the last one ever seen. There was a 2011 reported sighting of a desert rat kangaroo nest, but this yielded no usable DNA. Another animal I can't say, so I'm just gonna dub is the giant capybaras, coming in at number three. Josephio argiacea. I'm lucky if I managed that correctly. You'd also be able to be lucky to survive one of these things because they're literally giant killer hell rats. They complete opposite in every way to what we just covered in the last point. These inflated rodents resemble capybaras the size of cows, with an estimated average weight of one ton. And it's the largest rodent known to have lived, which was approximately four to two million years ago during the Pliocene to the early Pleiocene. Imagine a bunch of killer rats just roaming around, 10 feet long with another five feet of tail. They might have been herbivores, but their foot long incisors would have packed such a strong bite that I don't want to think about it. Some theories suggested that they used said teeth to fight over females for breeding rights, but other than that, they used them like shovels to find roots. The Pliocene era is around the same time that the last ice age ended. Changes in climactic conditions are believed to have contributed to the decline of the species, alongside competition from invasive species migrating from North America. For number two, we look at what I can only dub as cursed elephants. It's like a wizard came along, and since the elephants were talking crap about them, the wizard cursed them to have upside down mouths. Why are your tusks there, bro? Seriously. Today's elephants obviously have uh, less eyesore tusks, ones that come straight out of their jaws since they're supposed to be teeth, but their ugly cousin ancient relatives did not have the same arrangement, evidently. Around 20 million years ago, there lived a prehistoric creature named the Deotherium. It was, its name was accurately derived from the ancient Greek word for terrible beast, and the large prehistoric elephant survived until the early Pleidocene. Uh, precisely what the elephant used its bizarre tusks for isn't clear to scientists. One out of pocket throwaway idea is that the Deotherium used to use them to anchor itself to riverbanks while sleeping so its body could just float in deep water. Amazingly, isolated populations of Deotherium persisted into historical times until they either succumbed to changing climate conditions or were hunted into extinction by early Homo sapiens. Not any of our distant relatives like Neanderthals. They were hunted by us. That means these awful looking things existed at the same time as modern humans. Imagine seeing one of those at night, half asleep while trying to pee in a bush. Stuff of nightmares. Anyways, always the last but never the least, it's number one, the Tasmanian tiger, aka the thylacine. Can't tell if it's a cat or a dog just by looking at it, but they're pretty cute. As you can see, they're about the size of a coyote and they have a magnificent wide long snout, helping them be apex predators. In fact, they were the only marsupial apex predator that lived in modern times, and therefore they played a massive key role in the ecosystem. Naturally, that doesn't bode well with humans. European settlers of the 1800s get all mad and blame the TT for the death of their livestock. In reality, records of farm animal deaths in those times show that the culprits are feral dogs and human habitat mismanagement. You'd think if you invaded someone else's land and chose to live there, completely inept at cultivating it, you don't get to complain about the ecosystem around you. But instead, the Euro settlers hunted the Tasmanian tigers to the point of extinction. Eventually, all that remained were in zoos, and the last of the tigers named Benjamin died from negligent exposure in 1936 at the Bumera Zoo in Tasmania. Negligent exposure. This happened directly after the animal was granted protection status. Benjamin is also the only Tasmanian caught on film, as you can see in this colorized version. So, interesting news times. Two layers to it. The first is that the TT could still persist in the most remote parts of the island. In July of 2019, Australian authorities received a report of a footprint spotted by an unnamed individual on a walk up the Sleeping Beauty Mountain. The man, to quote, wasn't able to take a photo. However, when he got home, he Googled it and believes it was the Tasmanian Tigers. That same year, more credibly, a government plant biologist saw what they believed to be a Tasmanian Tiger 100 feet away from him in a remote area. Meanwhile, in 2018, three cyclists insisted they witnessed a TT crossing the road in front of them. These are just three of more than 1,200 alleged sightings reported between 1910 and 2019. Layer number two, almost 100 years after its extinction, the Tasmanian tiger may live once again in a different way, a sketchy Jurassic Park kind of way. Scientists want to resurrect the carnivorous marsupial by harnessing advances in genetics, ancient DNA retrieval, and artificial reproduction. The initiative is taking place at their thylacine integrated genetic restoration research lab and is headed by Professor Andrew Pass, who says that this technology offers a chance to correct extinction and could be applied in exceptional circumstances where cornerstone species have been lost. All right, thank you so much for tuning in and watching today's video. I hope it was as fun as it was educational. Be sure to subscribe to The Hive for regular video updates on all things history, archaeology, discovery, and science. Peace till next time.